Hello, my name is Tom Pollard. I'm a professor at Yale University. And I'd like to uh, share with you in a few minutes uh, my belief for why biologists must be good advocates for the science that they do. Um, I'm sure you're all aware, at least uh, in principle, with where the funds come from for our research. Some of it comes from private organizations, but the vast amount of uh, money that supports biological research comes from the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, and other uh, agencies of the federal government. So the answer to the first question is that the federal government is supporting most of our research, for which we are all grateful. So who advocates for federal funds? And uh, you have to appreciate that virtually everyone who has uh, any sort of uh, organization in the United States is impacted in some way by federal funds. So consider the kinds of people who would be concerned about the legislative process which I just described. They include uh, oil companies, it includes banks, it includes insurance companies, it includes educators, it includes medical schools, it includes doctors, it includes people who are in favor and against guns, uh, it includes virtually every organized group in the country. And all of them are looking out for themselves. And we have to look out for ourselves as well because we're competing with all of them for a limited amount of federal funds. So who advocates for biomedical research? Well, historically, this has been the province of uh, two different kinds of organizations. On one side, we've had the voluntary health organizations, such as the American Cancer Society, or the Juvenile Diabetes Society, which have patients and their families who are concerned about a particular disease. And they bring their cause to uh, the federal government and argue in favor for funding for those specific diseases. And they are great allies for us because they care passionately about biomedical research. Another uh, group that advocates for biomedical research are the organizations that represent the deans of the medical schools and the presidents of the research universities, the Association of American Universities and the American Association of Medical Colleges. Uh, and uh, traditionally, they've had our best interests in mind. But in the late 1980s, the bench scientists became concerned about the message that uh, the, the uh, government was receiving about the priorities in the, for the biomedical research community. And uh, a group of us scientists uh, independently organized a third uh, uh, branch of advocacy for uh, biomedical research. And that's what I'd like to tell you a little bit about now. Uh, the problem was, at that time and extending to today, uh, the vast majority of uh, biomedical researchers are completely on the sidelines when it comes to advocating for uh, our own needs, that is, the funds to support our very worthy work. And this is uh, very disturbing to me because we have a very virtuous cause compared to many of the other causes that are advocated for um, by uh, other groups in the, in the country. And it's also disturbing to me because we have a very highly educated, articulate group of people who are vitally dependent on federal funding to do their work, work that benefits not only uh, every person in the country and the world, but also benefits greatly the economy of the United States. So we have a virtuous cause, an articulate group of advocates, and yet most biomedical scientists have been on the sidelines. So how can you help? Uh, I've got a few suggestions here. And the first one is that you join a professional society that has an advocacy program. Uh, this will provide you a, a built-in environment in which you can be successful as an advocate. Uh, many, but not all, of the, the uh, basic science and uh, clinical research societies uh, do have advocacy uh, efforts. It's relatively new. It's all started in the last 25 years. So check and see whether the uh, society uh, that you're interested in joining does have an advocacy program. Secondly, uh, join your... Uh, society's um, advocacy grassroots network. Uh, many, but not all, societies have uh, thousands, up to thousands of their members connected uh, by email and other means to 
uh, allow the members to stay informed about issues in Washington and to react for requests for help. Help in the form of uh, telephone calls to elected officials or letters to elected official. So join your society's advocacy network and, uh, and uh, help out. Then you can do more. You can actually volunteer to help your society with advocacy. Uh, no society has too many people volunteering to help out with advocacy. So your um, uh, volunteering will be uh, very welcome. Another thing you could do is to visit your uh, elected officials at home in your, your uh, congressional district or in Washington, D.C. And many, but not all, scientific societies have organized Capitol Hill days where you can uh, get some help visiting uh, members of Congress. The people who've done this uh, find this very energizing and usually return home uh, much better advocates than they were before they went on the Capitol Hill day. And we have many examples around the country of where uh, uh, scientists have returned to their home institution and, adv and organized uh, very effective local uh, advocacy efforts. A final suggestion here is, that, uh, is to let your elected officials know what happens after you've had your grant um, reviewed. Uh, this is a, an idea from Larry Goldstein in, in San Diego. I think it's a brilliant idea and it's, it's rarely done, but it should be very effective we, if we can get it uh, used more broadly. The idea is uh, if you get good news uh, that your grant's been funded, you should write your uh, uh, representative and your two senators from your state and say thank you for helping appropriate the funds that will allow me to do research that will benefit uh, mankind and will stimulate the economy in our city and our state. Equally important, it would be a good idea for you to write your uh, representative and your two U.S. Senators if your grant is not funded and to let them know how disappointed you are that you will not be receiving support from the federal government <clears throat> and how this might set back your research, how it might uh, result in your having to lay off people in your lab, how it will re reduce your ability to uh, purchase goods and services in the city and the state and that therefore it will have a negative uh, economic impact on the state. I mean, I think that one of the main problems is that, the, that a lot of the people who represent us in Congress don't actually know what's going on in their own, own district and how much um, uh, uh, we all depend on the federal government for funding. In, in many cities, for example, let's say uh, Tucson, Arizona, or uh, New Haven, Connecticut, the number one employer in these uh, cities is, in fact, uh, a university with a large uh, biomedical research operation. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, people are concerned about is that they, uh, they feel, well, gosh, I, I just don't have the stature to go talk to somebody important like a member of Congress. But I'm afraid you've got it exactly backwards. Uh, members of Congress are very poorly educated in, in the sciences as things go. And what you'll discover is if you go to visit your member of Congress, and say, I'm a scientist, I'm doing research in cellular and molecular biology, uh, the, about the first thing they'll do is apologize for the fact that they uh, last took a, a science course when they were in high school and they probably didn't do too well at it. And they might try to make a joke out of this and saying because they did so poorly in science that they decided to become a politician instead. So uh, you've got the upper hand when you go to visit your member of Congress. They're going to admire the fact that you're smart enough and well-educated enough to be a scientist, and they will listen to what you have to say. Uh, they, they need to hear from you. Uh, uh, you might think that just one or two letters uh, wouldn't make a difference, but uh, actually a very small number of letters uh, will be registered as a concern on the part of constituents. And if you could possibly generate 20 or 30 letters from your congressional district, that would be considered to be a huge amount of a concern on the part of constituents about an issue, in this case, federal funding for biomedical research. So uh, beyond uh, participating in your society's advocacy program, there are actually some other things that you can do. Uh, one is to vote for and support political candidates who value science. Uh, it is a perfectly legal and actually a responsibility of all of us to uh, participate in electoral politics, and that is to support candidates who we favor. And you can do this by uh, 
providing um, uh, campaign funds for them. It costs a million dollars to get elected to the House of Representatives and $10 million to get elected to the Senate. So they're always looking for financial support. And so uh, you should get to know your elected officials and uh, contribute to their political campaigns. And let them know you're a contributor when you, when you see them. Uh, I even contribute to the political campaigns of uh, members of Congress who do not live in the state of Connecticut. Uh, those particular individuals who are particularly important for uh, their advocacy and their championing the NIH and the other science agencies. Second thing you could do would be to share your science in your community. Um, uh, many communities have science cafes, so volunteer to uh, give a talk at your local science cafe. Um, if by chance uh, you know somebody who's in a, in a service club like a Lions or Rotary, you could tell them you'd be willing to come give a talk about your research. Um, reach out to uh, your church groups and, and others in your community. Another thing you can do uh, is to invite elected officials to visit your laboratory. Uh, they'll consider this to be a treat. Although having given you this advice, I, I must give you a word of caution too. You need to coordinate this activity with your government affairs people at your university uh, because they're actively engaged with um, uh, interfacing with uh, politicians and they'll want to know that you've done this and to help coordinate the visit. And finally, you, you, if you're really keen about this, uh, you might consider a career in public policy. Some of us, like myself, have had a little side career in public policy as we've been pursuing our academic careers and that's, that's certainly one way to do it. And we could certainly use more help, more leadership in the advocacy community. But uh, uh, others have uh, decided they want to make this a full-time uh, career. And uh, for example, the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences has a beautiful fellowship program that allows scientists to uh, spend a couple of years in Washington, D.C., either working on Capitol Hill or in one of the agencies to learn about how government works and to uh, uh, become a member of the community. So Washington, thanks to the AAAS, is now heavily populated with people who used to be bench scientists who've transitioned into careers in, in uh, the federal government uh, through their uh, fellowship program. So I'd recommend that to you highly. If you want to uh, learn more about what I've just said, I wrote an article for Cell uh, that appeared in, in 2012. Uh, here's the reference and I provide a, a, a lot more details and uh, links so that you can hook up with uh, uh, groups in the community who are uh, helping scientists be good advocates. And please help out. Thank you.